that introduction and listening to my, child, my grandchildren bouncing around reminded me of my mother shouting at me when I was younger, saying, please don't yell like a fishmonger's wife. I will try not to read this reading in that vein. Isaiah 55 can be found on page 743 of the Pew Bibles, if you wish to follow it. Come, all of you are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways declares the lord as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seeds for the sower and bread for the eater so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in praise. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper. Instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Thanks be to God for his word. Thank you for reading that for us. Do uh, keep that passage open. It's uh, Isaiah 55. It's uh, on page 743, 744. And I'm not sure whether... Is it? Great. <laughs> Let's pray together, shall we? Our gracious Father, we want to hear you speaking through your word uh, this morning. And so we pray that as we open this passage from Isaiah, that you'd speak into our minds and through our minds, into our hearts and into our lives. Lord, change us that we might be more like Jesus. We ask it to his glory. Amen. Our whole life depends upon trusting the promises that other people make whether it's the promise on a £10 note to pay the bearer on demand, or whether it's the vows that are made on a, a wedding day, or whether it's simply the promise to meet for coffee at such and such a time, or the promise to be home early. Life depends upon promises. But as we reach Isaiah 55, we find actually some extraordinary and amazing promises from God. Promises which are tied to the servant that we've met over and over again 
over these last few weeks as we've been looking through this section of Isaiah the prophet. Four extraordinary promises that I want to look at uh, this morning. And we'll just look briefly at each one in turn. And the first one is in verses 1 and 2, right at the beginning of the passage, the promise of complete satisfaction. Complete satisfaction. Uh, last Friday was our granddaughter's sixth birthday. Uh, it, I have to say, it, it's difficult to know what she was more excited about in advance. Whether it was the scooter with flashing wheels when it went fast, or whether it was the multicoloured cardigan, both of which were birthday presents, whether it was wearing the birthday hat at school all day, which uh, rated very highly in expectation before the birthday, or whether it was the birthday tea at Pizza Express. Now, I, I have to say that she is a delight to buy presents for, because every present is greeted with squeals of delight and joy. But she's six years old, and we know that the presents won't last. She'll outgrow the scooter and the cardigan. She'll have other interests and favourite activities. And life is constantly like that, isn't it? So often what satisfies us one day will inevitably disappoint us the next. If you suggested to a teenager that it might be exciting to wear a birthday hat in school all day, you would be greeted with significant disappointment. And we put so much energy, don't we, into things that may please us for a time, but provide no lasting satisfaction. But look at the promise that uh, Tim has already uh, pointed us to earlier with that brilliant illustration that helps us so much. That promise in, in verse 1, in Isaiah 55, verse 1. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. It is free. Those things are free because someone else has paid for them. Uh, Linda and uh, my daughter had an interesting experience a couple of days ago when they, uh, they took our grandchildren to buy ice creams in the little shop around the corner. And as the children stood over the ice cream counter, um, deciding whether they wanted a twister or a magnum or a this or a that, a gentleman outside opened the door of the shop, came in, put a five pound note down on the ice cream counter and said, buy them each an ice cream and walked off. Just extraordinary. <laughs> We didn't know him, they didn't know him, never seen him before. And in a sense, that's a picture, isn't it, of, of what we have here, where God's promise is, eat what is good, delight in the richest of fare. Literally, delight your soul in abundance. I guess that during a cost of living crisis, this invitation resonates more fully with us, doesn't it? But it speaks into the deepest parts of our lives at a, a time when we're learning to prioritize so that we have what we need to live. The passage tells us here is a certain promise from God that he will meet the deepest needs of your soul at no cost to you. No cost to you. But there are two things that are necessary, again, as, as Tim helped us to, to, to see so helpfully. The first is that we must recognize that we are in need spiritually, that we are thirsty. Without that, that we can't receive the promise. But secondly, we need to come and listen. Do you remember how Jesus cried out in the temple courts on the Feast of Tabernacles in John chapter 7? He said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. A little bit like the, uh, the fishmonger, if you like. But let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink, said Jesus. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Here, in John 7, 
is the promise of Isaiah fulfilled in Jesus. It's as simple as that, says Jesus. Come, you've got to come. But come to me and drink. And it's not just that the promise was available for the people of Isaiah's time or the people when uh, Jesus cried out in the temple courts. The prom promise is valid for all time. Listen to Revelation 22. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. And this promise is not just for eternity. It's not just pie in the sky when we die, if you like. This isn't what the Apostle Paul tells the Philippian Christians in Philippians chapter 4. He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Through Jesus. Paul knows the extremes of plenty and need, but is still content in every situation, still satisfied, completely satisfied, because of Jesus. So here is the promise of complete satisfaction for this life and for eternity. But then, secondly, if we go back to Isaiah 55, we find the promise of renewed relationship. There in verses 3 to 5, if you've got it open in front of you. One of the painful lessons that we learned through the COVID pandemic was just how important relationships are for us as human beings. I personally discovered that and, and learned that in new ways on a number of levels. It was painful only to be allowed to stand at the gate of my daughter's house and wave at my grandchildren in the doorway a distance away. I wanted to hug them. But it was also in a different way painful to cross the road when strangers walked towards me on the same pavement because I wanted to brush past them. And I suspect that we all learnt through those painful experiences that we were designed for relationship. That's what Genesis 2 is all about. God created us for two significant relationships. A relationship with one another as human beings and a relationship with God himself. And yet, both relationships are damaged in Genesis chapter 3. And every generation since has experienced the relationship with their creator as broken. But now, here in Isaiah 55, is the promise of an everlasting covenant, an eternal relationship of love, initiated not, not by us, but by God himself. It is the fulfillment of a promise that God made to King David that is now brought to fruition through the Lord's servant. You see, the promise is now personal in two senses. It is personal insofar as it focuses on the Lord's servant. Give ear and come to me, says verse 3. Come to me personally. And the Lord's servant will draw nations, draw people who do not know him to himself. And as Jesus promised in, uh, in John chapter 12, Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. It's personal. But it's personal also because it is there so that you and I may live. Literally, your soul may live, says Isaiah 55. As we saw last week, the Lord's servant Jesus suffered for us. And so we are given the promise of a new eternal relationship with God, who for his own honour and glory says to us, come, come listen, that you may live. 
the promise of complete satisfaction and the promise of a new, renewed relationship. But then thirdly, in Isaiah 55, there is the promise of complete forgiveness. There in verses 6 through to 11. I find that my email box is full of very urgent requests for me to buy certain products. If I don't buy it by this afternoon, then the opportunity will have gone. Or um, urgent requests for me to reply to particular surveys, because if I don't reply by such and such a time, I won't be entered into the draw with a possibility of having £100 worth of this product. Somewhere, someone is working very hard to find new ways of grabbing my attention with urgent messages of mass advertising. Now, here in Isaiah 55, things are getting both personal, but also urgent. So just listen and look down at verse 6. Do you see there in verse 6? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. In other words, we do not have all the time in the world. None of us know what tomorrow, what this afternoon even, may bring. A couple of years ago I had a significant, very major, pulmonary embolism blood clot on the, on the, uh, on the lung. I, I passed out through lack of oxygen. Linda phoned the, uh, the ambulance, which was there in five minutes, and I was blue-lighted to the RUH. Now, I have to confess that I treated that rather lightly. I, I kind of thought, oh, it's all right. It wasn't a major problem. <laughs> I was out of hospital in, uh, in about 36 hours, whatever it was until someone I know died from exactly the same condition. Now I'm on permanent medication, but it was a reminder to me that none of us know when we will stand before our God and answer to him. None of us know. And so comes the urgent call here in Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. But it's more than simply seeking. We are, says Isaiah 55, to repent. Uh, repentance has, again, two aspects to it uh, here in these verses. Uh, forsaking wicked ways and thoughts, in other words, turning away, but also turning to the Lord for his mercy and forgiveness. And here's the amazing promise there in, uh, in the passage. He will have mercy. He will freely pardon. There in verse 7. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God. For he will freely pardon. There is an absolute guarantee here. Unlike some of the offers that I receive by email, this offer from God is an absolute certainty. But just look very carefully at why this is a certainty. You see, it's not because our repentance in some way is certain to be effective. That we like to think, oh, it's, it's me repenting, that's what's done this. That's not what it says here. Just look at verses 8 through to 11 there. Do you see that in the same way that the rain is guaranteed to water the earth, making it flourish, as we know only too well this week, and uh, I gather we know a little bit too well in this building, in the same way that the rain is guaranteed to water the earth and make it flourish, so God's word will always accomplish what he purposes. Verse 10. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. In other words, God's word will accomplish whatever he promises. God's promise of forgiveness is guaranteed 
to us by the certain effectiveness of his word. You see, where our word is not always trustworthy, let's be honest, God's word is. And so we can seek the Lord with confidence while he will freely pardon, because his word is trustworthy and fulfills everything that he promises. So the promise of complete satisfaction, a renewed relationship, of complete forgiveness. And then finally, very briefly, the promise of renewed creation. There in those last two verses, 12 and 13. One of the reasons that we often lack satisfaction in our lives uh, is that our lives are burdened with disappointment. It's quite simply the nature of our world, isn't it? We live in a world where things decay and die, where flowers grow, bloom, and then fade away, where so often things never reach their anticipated fulfillment. And I, I think that's why when young people die, um, perhaps in, in tragic circumstances, their, their families often set up a trust in memory of them or want to have a new law in their name. There's a sense of having been cheated of hope and expectation. But the final promise of these verses is the greatest of all and gives the answer to that sense of being cheated by the disappointments of this world. It is the promise of renewed creation. A new world in which the whole of creation bursts forth with praise and joy for its creator. The curse of Genesis 3, where the earth produces thorns and thistles, is now reversed. And instead of the thorn bush, grows the juniper. Instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. In his uh, hymn, Loved with Everlasting Love, uh, George Robinson describes our awareness of that renewed creation in the world now, in our experience as Christian believers now. The second verse goes like this. Heaven above is deeper blue, earth around a sweeter green. That which glows in every hue Christless eyes have never seen. Birds in song his glory show, flowers with richer beauties shine, since I know as now I know, I am his, and he is mine. But it's actually, however wonderful that description is, it's even better than that. Because what God promised is to us is so much greater than just a better life now. This renewed creation is more wonderful than anything we will ever experience here. It is a place of eternal joy and wonder, and beauty. And it's, test, it's a testimony to the grace and the mercy of God because it is his gift, free gift, to those who come to him. So four amazing promises for you and for me from God. But let me just say this as we close. I, I don't know where you stand this morning. But if you've never come and received those promises, the invitation is urgent. Seek the Lord while he may be found. I, the offer of, uh, uh, of chocolates and wine gums was limited. If you didn't come then, you missed out. The invitation here is urgent. Seek the Lord while he may be found. But if you, as I suspect, are have already come, already trusting Jesus for the fulfillment of these promises for you personally. Let me say this this morning. Hold on to them. Hold on to them. There will be many things in this life that want to draw us away. Many things that seem to offer satisfaction now and yet are ultimately empty. If we have what is promised here, then we have nothing to fear, have we? We can make the sacrifices that are necessary in this life as we follow the way of the servant Jesus because we know that we have now and in eternity complete satisfaction, now and forever. We have a renewed relationship with our creator which will never end. We have complete forgiveness guaranteed by his word. 
and we have confidence in a renewed creation for the whole of eternity. Let's pray. Just in the quiet, let me invite you to reflect on what it will mean today for you to come afresh, to hear afresh those promises, maybe to receive them for the first time, but maybe to hear them again in the light of so many things that draw us away, so many things that offer a different kind of satisfaction that will not last. And in the quiet, let's just ask God to help us to hold on to these promises. Gracious Father, we ask that you would hear us and answer us. In Jesus' name, amen.